Great. Good afternoon and welcome to today's Dean's Speaker Series. I'm Jillian Grennan and I teach the SIF class here at Hawes. And it's a great pleasure today to be able to introduce today's guest speaker, Katie Hall. Katie is the founder and co-chair of Hall Capital Partners. Founded in 1994, HCP manages over $40 billion in investments for foundations, endowments, and large pools of family capital. It is one of the largest woman-led investment companies in the world. She's also the co-founder and co-executive chair of Galvanize Climate Solutions. Galvanize's unique investment strategy is helping to accelerate and scale the adoption of clean technology and increase the rate of decarbonization. I know we're all looking forward to hearing more about that today. And Katie's work places her at the forefront of financial leaders who really understand that the pursuit of financial returns is, in fact, compatible with consideration of environmental and social outcomes. Here at Hawes, we're keenly aware of this important link. In 2008, Hawes launched the nation's first student-led socially responsible investment fund. And today, our sustainable and impact finance initiative is educating the next generation of leaders and leveraging finance and investment to drive positive change in the world. Each year, over 150 MBA students take classes in impact and ESG investing. In today's conversation, we'll be discussing how investment is being leveraged to create these important social changes and what we should expect to see in the near future. As leading today's conversation will be Ann Harrison, the 15th Dean of the Haas School of Business. A renowned economist, Dean Harrison has dedicated her career to creating an inclusive and sustainable policies, both through her studies of development economics, international trade, and global labor markets. She now brings this focus to higher education, here at what we can call the greatest public university and the greatest public business school in the world. We are so proud to be celebrating a special lineup of speakers on sustainability as part of this semester's Dean's Speaker Series. So with that, please join me in giving a warm welcome for Ann Harrison and Katie Hall. Katie, um, I just want to start out by saying we're just so thrilled that you're here today. Mm -hmm. This is really exciting for all of us. Our students, many of those in the room, many of those who are watching um, from their computers somewhere and our alumni as well who might be watching outside of this room are really, really interested in uh, impact investing, venture capital, uh, early stage entrepreneurship. So maybe we could just start out with, maybe you could just tell us some major trends and exciting new investment opportunities that you are seeing at Hall Capital, uh, particularly coming out of the pandemic and in this age of, of transformation and, and social impact? It's been quite volatile out there in the world of investing over this past year. So in some sense, it is a really interesting time to think about trends because we're at such a point of transition across so many dimensions. Um, I mean, the volatility that has cascaded through the public markets into the private markets and is you know, recalibrating how generations of people are having to think about investments and their prospects, particularly as we factor in concern about a looming recession and what that might or might not um, generate in terms of as both opportunities and risks. We are against that sort of chaotic backdrop. We continue to see some really interesting things um, from managers, really across the board, NASA classes. Um, certainly in uh, kind of venture capital and early stage, there remains high level activity in things around climate, climate investing. There's really interesting things um, probably in the public, private um, uh, world of biotech and the intersection of technology uh, and sort of more traditional biotech investing. Again, that's just been a wild mess of companies that went public too soon and are still incredibly interesting. And so now there's real interesting things to do there. Um, and just more broadly, uh, in terms of different industries, different companies that are part of kind of transforming systems. I mean, we are really at the point of entire systems of our infrastructure undergoing radical changes and needing to go radical changes. And so the opportunities and companies that are part of that are where we think there's interesting things to do. 
So um, let me just follow up on that a little bit. So we think of the venture capital industry as really primarily uh, fueling the development of the tech industry, right? But, but beyond tech, um, what's the role for venture capital in other sectors, in the energy sector, in the social impact sector, even in the, for example, food sector? Um, do you see a unique role for venture capital to play in these other areas? You know, I think that we're, we see a really important recognition of the opportunity of these transition sectors. I mean, we're seeing this um, in terms of particularly in around a number of things in uh, ag tech, again, everything's tech, right? Climate tech, ag tech, but as, as systems are needed to change, we're seeing a lot of activity. And it's not just in um, devices or kind of hard technology, but it's other parts of um, really interesting software solutions and software tools that are being built to measure or increase efficiency. So across all of those different dimensions, there is a lot of activity. And it's moved beyond just sort of the you know, only kind of you know, SaaS or only sort of you know, something sort of for consumer products. Huh, interesting. So, so let's turn a little bit to uh, Hall Capital. So Hall Capital um, has this uh, uh, framework which you call full consequence investing. And I'm wondering if you can explain to me and our audience, what do you mean by full consequence investing? How do you use it at Hall Capital to make decisions? Uh, and I'm sure our audience is wondering, do you use it for your whole portfolio, or do you use it only for certain kinds of funds? So just to give a little bit uh, more context, so Hall Capital is a firm that works, as we said in the introduction, with um, families, foundations, endowments. And we're building typically global multi-asset class portfolios. So Hall Capital's role is to evaluate um, and identify investment managers that can then, we will then hire to fill out part of an overall portfolio. So in Hall Capital land, um, we look at a whole range of different investment managers. And the word, the full consequence investing came about I actually coined that phrase, and then we totally trademarked it, um, in like 2013, and it really came about because I was so frustrated by how everybody was using terms in different ways. So people were talking about impact investing, or SRI investing, or ESG investing, and everybody met something different by it. And you know, it had different embedded return expectations and different. So we thought that for us, kind of ESG investing, us, Hall Capital, ESG investing really was about um, deep fundamental investing rooted in a belief that if you are using your human capital, your human resources, your physical resources, and your financial resources in the most sustainable way, and actually looking at those in a really holistic way, and considering the consequences of all the different parts of your business strategy, that you would make, you, the company would make better decisions, you would be a stronger company, and ultimately more profitable company. So our formulation of ESG is trying to get at this idea that we think that incorporating those is actually an additive factor to companies' kind of trajectories, and ultimately investment managers who emphasize that we'll be making better choices. So today, across um, all the different asset classes, we basically map out our investment managers. So we, you know, well, let's stipulate, we only invest with people that are of integrity, that are doing good work, you know, so we lop off one end of the tail maybe a pretty fat tail, I might add. Um, but we lap off. And so our managers, we would consider um, sort of uh, traditional investment managers that are fundamental factors in looking at all of those that are um, integrated. That's sort of our halfway there. And then um, people that have ESG factors is really a central, deeply embedded part of their um, strategy. And when we are building FCI only portfolios, 
we are only using those managers who the issue factor analysis is central to their policy. And we actually, you know, this is something that was relatively straightforward in um, equities, increasingly doable and not that problematic in um, kind of venture and private equity, again, we're looking to build diversified portfolios, quite doable in fixed income, although you have to accept the fact that you know you have to have an opinion about the government as being a good actor. Right? People have different views on that, but let's stipulate that in ours. Um, and then, but it's been hard in um, hedge fund land, and that has a lot to do with the fact that it's shorter duration investments. And most good fundamental investing in regards of asset class does need some duration to pay off. But we've worked with different managers, and, and that is a place where it's become a bit more of a filter-based um, incorporation of ESG factors to meet it. So I mean, it's, it's, a, it's an area that we've seen um, growing interest from different, particularly with families and foundations both, are very, very interested in building sort of global multi-asset class, FCI, portfolios um, that really have the, it's not, there's, you don't have to have an expect, expected discount of your return. And we, that's a straight up return, just like all the other portfolios. Thank you. Um, so I'm, I'm just so in awe of everything that you do and the fact that you've got $41 billion in assets under management. Um, you're one of the largest women-led investment companies in the world. Um, and, uh, but at the same time, you work in a very male-dominated industry. So I, I, do, I have seen that despite the fact that it is a very male-dominated industry, at least 50% of your senior managers are women. Congratulations on that. Um, so I'm curious, what were some of the biggest challenges that, that you face as a woman in, in setting up your fund? You know, um, we were talking a little bit earlier about sort of winding paths and how things work out. And I would say that I experienced the, those um, biases in different ways. My first job out of business school, um, I went to one down the peninsula, um, was uh, at a big investment bank. And it, you know, it was still just ridiculously old school. And there was, def there was very clear cases um, of particularly around compensation, um, bonus compensation, that you know, the guy before me was treated differently than us. I made a choice really early in my career to sort of kind of opt out of that. Right? I left, I only worked for two years at a big firm after business school, and then I went and um, joined my friend Tom Steyer, who I have come back around, um, to in what was then a small, very small hedge fund, became a big hedge fund. Um, so I went to work. And Penny, I, I left then three years later to start my own. So I've had the luxury of being able to create my own cultures, my own environments, and um, build things the way they think they should be. And you know that has really paid off. Um, I think that it is also something that, as we have built Galvanize, um, which we just, Tom and I just started a year plus ago, We've been very intentional about having uh, that, that company, too, is 50-50, men and women, um, uh, and with interesting diversity across multiple dimensions. Uh, and we think we're st stronger and more attractive for it. But, but it was because I actually said, you know, I definitely wasn't going to stay in the system. I was going to just build outside the system. So let me, let me follow up on that question. So we have these incredible students here at Berkeley Haas, who, who, many of them who are very interested in finance and venture capital, but many of them who also want to build a more equitable, sustainable, inclusive world. What would your advice to them be in, in um, proceeding along this path that you have pioneered? How do, how do you do all, both of those things? Um, there's so many different steps. I think that um, at a personal level, it has very much to do with 
how you choose to spend your time and the type of firms that you work for and the influences that you can have in terms of changing or modifying cultures. And a big part of that, I think, comes from being as brutally aware as you can be of your own biases. We all have our biases and limitations and have things built into the systems that sort of counterbalance that. I think it also is a view of you know, cumulative experience, right? You, it might make sense to gain one set of experiences at a particular firm for a period of time to give you the platform and the capacity and the power, I use that word intentionally, to do something on your own and be in a more of a directive So like model. what you did, you so started did. in a I more did. traditional area and then you, you moved. Yeah. So it's not so much it, where you start, but. It, it, I think it's, it's, I very much think that. I think that as you're evaluating jobs, you know, pay a lot of attention to sort of the culture and the things because you want, if you're going to go that route, you want to be able to accomplish and gain the learnings that you want that then are useful when you're in a position to uh, do more. But I also think that um, there's, it is, there is a lot of things that are happening. And I do, you know, coming back to some of the early points, I think that, um, again, this is a little bit wearing my galvanized hat, but when there's huge transitions and huge change um, in areas that are mission aligned and are around climate or around solving societal problems, there's just really interesting opportunity and those firms exist. And so you can also you know, increasingly push to find those firms that are thinking that way. So you've mentioned uh, galvanized climate solutions uh, several times. So maybe we can just talk about that. So sure. this is a new venture, a new investment platform that you founded with Tom Steyer. Um, and we would love to hear more about it. So tell us what kind of investments are you making? Um, and here's a question. Maybe you could talk after you talk about that a little bit. How, and this is a question that we always ask in this area, how are you going to measure impact? So um, yeah, it's a huge issue. We could probably spend the entire afternoon just on that topic alone of impact measurement. But let me start with a little bit of, of an intro to Galvanize. So, um, so Tom and I actually go, Tom Steyer and I uh, go way back. We met at our very first jobs as analysts at Morgan Stanley in New York, where we went prior to, we both were working there, went to that other business school and then went back to New York. And then, as I'd said, I joined him as his partner in 1986, a long time ago. Um, and so uh, we have been each other's sort of sounding boards, advisors, confidence for a long time. And when Tom left Farallon in 2012, um, some of you may have encountered him, he really was one of the leading climate um, leaders, advocates, he more, was more than a gadfly, um, you know, very much, you know, strong um, voices. And then when, in sort of in the early part of 2021, Tom was thinking a lot about what, what he wanted to do. He had his foray into presidential politics, like what he wanted to do with his capital and his time kind of for the next chapter since he had no interest in retiring, I had no interest in retiring. Although I was stepping back to sort of just a part-time uh, position at Hall Capital. And we really kept coming around to the view that the existential crisis of our time is climate. This is an area that we know needs trillions of dollars of capital marshaled. Um, and we thought that we could do what each of us had done in our respective careers which is you know, build an investment platform to marshal that, at least some of that capital, to you know, accelerate, to provide, to develop solutions to the climate crisis and you know, really help move the transition to a net zero global economy along more rapidly. Um, and we thought we could do it in a different kind of investment firm that um, didn't have to be like all of these other firms that looked a certain way. Um, and we really thought 
that it had to be um, a, 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 a big, significant platform. We needed to take a leadership position in it, and that we needed to be able to invest in a way that generated compelling returns for our investors, that it wasn't concessionary, but that it would be a, a one of the leading investment firms, as well as a deeply mission-driven organization. And we want and we plan on having a number of different investment strategies um, over time. We started um, with um, investment strategy really focused on kind of early stage VC and growth capital, but we have a team that is going to be a public equity strategy. Actually, just today, we announced a person that is joining to um, build real estate strategy. So it's across a whole range of strategies that we're going to have. Um, and it's been just a crazy rocket ship of the past 13 months since we started. Built, just like, you know, it's a, we're a startup, um, which is all about strategy, capital raising, and um, people. And it's been really an exciting time to get all the people. We have been investing in the innovation and expansion, which is sort of this VC and um, uh, growth capital um, sets of companies. We've made some initial investments already. And the, the whole area of measurement and impact is, has, is, is a critical one. I mean, it's the core, right, of what our mission is, is to have impact. And so how we measure that is sort of multi-layers. And it's going to vary to a certain extent, strategy by strategy, with some common themes. So what we are doing in the innovation expansion arena is it, again, sort of steps and at kind of the risk of being a little bit granular, I think it's worth kind of getting into. So we start with kind of the whole pipeline of companies that we're looking at and investment opportunities. And we are assessing them we're putting them in kind of three buckets. We're putting them in a bucket of companies or strategies that um, can help to um, um, rebuild parts of the um, system, if you rebuild and rebuild part and replace um, things that are sort of old systems, then by replacing them, we can have a significant reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and or there's what we call restore, which also includes um, you know, sequestration strategies as well as other adaptation strategies. So from the beginning, we're looking at investment opportunities and saying, does this idea, does this company, does this technology have the capacity? Is it, is the, if you will, the TAM, is the total addressable market, well, in this case, we're kind of creating a total addressable climate impact. Is it big enough? Is it big enough that we have the, you know, kind of, be kind of in the zip code of something like 500, if it was adopted universally, you know, 500 megatons of emission reduction annually. That's sort of just as we're trying to scale things so that we're investing in things that have impact. Like we start from the beginning. We don't do it as an afterthought, right? Like a lot of investment firms go through their whole investment thing and then say, this is a great investment. Can we build some climate adjacencies? And that's not what we're doing. We're really interested in addressing that, thinking about that up front. Then we go through our kind of our whole range of um, uh, regular due diligence. We make an investment. We're asking our companies and ourselves to um, respond to the, we were laughing earlier about one of the things about business in general, but climate tech in jet particular, is it is filled with acronyms. And I'm like, OK, oh, which one am I talking about now? Um, but the. We're using the ESG uh, metrics that came out of something called the ESG Data Convergence Initiative, which was developed by a consortium or association of limited part, institutional limited partners and general partners. And, and it asked a series of questions about um, emissions, about renewable energy use, as well as a number of DEI and governance factors, you know, trying to get some standardization. And then we are looking very closely at company-specific things um, that there's like um, related to a particular company is um, going to um, aim to reduce the uh, usage of water in agriculture 
I mean, that is something that we can specifically measure, number of acres covered, number of uses, you know, they're, so they're company-specific KPIs. That's a really long way of saying it's complicated. It is case by case. It's going to vary strategy by strategy. The, we were, again, we were having this conversation earlier. It is a real problem. I actually think it's actually a real challenge for kind of industry and investors to find the appropriate balance between kind of quantitative measures as well as more um, you know, specific indicators to reflect impact. Um, and the shorthand kind of just snapshot I th either misses too much or oversimplifies. But the other answer, the long one that I just gave, it's also not completely satisfying because it's like, come on, right? That's so much work. How do you really know you're doing anything? So, it's I, a, I mean, I think this is incredibly really exciting area. what you're doing. I mean, you are at the forefront of change of how do we evaluate all these opportunities and, and do it in a way which is successful both from a business sense but also makes an enormous difference. I mean, I can't Im not imagine doing anything more important than what you're doing. Um, one quick question is, do you have certain sectoral priorities? So one of the challenges is that there are some areas which are just dirty areas. You know, making cement is dirty, but there are new changes that are coming forth. So you can make low carbon cement, you can make low carbon steel. It's hard right now in this period to imagine a world without using cement or steel. So are you work are you moving in those areas too or are you staying out of them? Oh no, we we are working this is a statement across the board at Galvanize. We're working across sort of all sectors and because we really think that we need to be part of the transition. And it's, it's funny you talk about cement. One of the uh, investments that we made is actually in a company that is um, a sensor company that can help, that is helped to make m more precise and improved um, mixes of both concrete and cement, which can significantly reduce the clinker co component, which can you know, substantially reduce the emissions. So we are seeing, I think many, we think we'll continue to see a lot of things across the board. I mean, if you look out there in sort of the venture side, the places that have just scooped up a hugely disproportionate amount of the dollars have been in mobility, think EV, um, and storage, think batteries, right? I mean, that's just a huge, really disproportionate amount. But we're seeing uh, very interesting things in ag, and food, um, we're seeing much harder problems, but maybe really interesting things in kind of industrial transformations. Um, we looked at a really interesting company, didn't end up doing it in the end for some capital reasons in plastic circularity. Um, and so, so it, it's, it's, a, it's across the board. Um, Wow, that's so interesting. So I do want to leave us a little bit of time for questions um, from the floor. So I, I, will, I only have a couple more questions. But I, I want to shift a little bit and think about the role of business versus the role of the, the public sector. So how important do you think the role of private companies, especially financial institutions, will be in getting to net zero? I mean, do you think that this whole transition is really being led by the private sector and by investment companies in moving towards net zero? Um, I definitely think, I mean, we live in a policy world in all these dimensions. But I think what we have seen is policy is um, developing so differently in different regions, whether it be the EU or um, certainly here or the UK or uh, China or India. Um, so what we are, what we, and what we have seen simultaneously with that is a really strong movement from um, particularly European pension funds in terms of demanding change, some US, and corporations are moving kind of across the board, not just, I mean, disproportionately, not just the financial institutions. It's really regular companies who are being demanded by their customers, uh, who are anticipating regulation, 
um, who are depending by kind of their investors to make change. I mean, the last number I saw, something like over 1,500 companies have made some version of net zero pledges. Now, probably a, only a small subset of them actually know how to get from A to B, but that the power of that momentum is real, I think, going to continue to be um, quite influential. Now, you then pair that with the public sector, right? You have the regulations in the EU that are coming that are going to accelerate disclosure, regardless of what the SEC does um, at the company level. You have the IRA, terrible name, I mean, seriously. Um, the IRA, which is actually one of the first significant, I mean, movement in terms of you know, setting up positive incentives as well as negative incentives around some of these transitions. So it will be a combination. Um, I, and, I and I think that what we're seeing from the financial institutions, um, well, let me we, ask we're, not, you. we're not leading. They, there was an attempt at leading again, from some of them. And then they got some pushback, and they start scurrying back. So I don't think that we have as much leadership from our, the larger financial institutions. I think I know which financial as institutions you might should. be referring to. <laughs> I think I'm, we should have more leadership. <laughs> OK, OK. So you're, you're suggesting it's, it's a partnership um, yes. with, with uh, some. And so let me ask you about one effort that's going on right now as we speak, the Securities and Exchange Commission. The SEC, um, which, as you all know, regulates financial markets, is uh, is proposing some regulatory uh, structures. In, in particular, they have released a proposal, which has not yet been confirmed, to mandate climate risk disclosures by public companies. I know they're also suggesting uh, release disclosing ESG strategies. What do you think about these um, proposals from the SEC. Do you think they're a good idea? Um, we actually are in a minority. I'm putting my galvanized hat on. Um, but uh, we are in a minority of a lot of the financial institutions and investment firms. We are strong supporters of the disclosure um, across the board. We think that it's imperfect. We know how difficult it is. Um, but we think that until we get to much greater transparency and people acknowledging what these risks are, um, even with imperfections, um, then we, we, it will be very difficult to make progress. Um, or it will be harder to make progress, let me say that. And again, we're seeing it in the EU. They are kind of requiring many of these disclosures in different ways. Um, I think one of the things that is interesting is, and it, we see it play out in the um, public press too, is there, it, there are such mixed signals coming about what to do with the information. I mean, I, was, yeah, I just saw something that the FDIC is continuing down their path of particularly encouraging banks to look at sort of the climate risks and sort of loans, particularly the smaller banks. And they're doing this scenario work with the big banks. But it's like, like OK, so like, what does that mean in a world where you can't get it, fire insurance or you can't get fire? So there's, there's a bit of a question as to, to what end on some of it. Um. Huh, in, yeah, interesting. Um, so I won't ask you why you're the, in the minority of uh, supporters, um, uh, but um, maybe what I will ask you is, um, what do you think needs to be done about um, greenwashing? I, it's, you know, it is a real thing. I do think that Greenwashing is, to a certain extent, solved by disclosures and a better version of impact reporting, of impact measurement. I mean, again, both Hall Capital and Galvanize are registered investment advisors. And you know, we have to live by kind of across the board by what we say. In theory, we have to be able to back up. Um, and I think a more pointed, I think that I don't have any trouble with a more pointed uh, requirement. To be so, precise. so you see these SEC uh, proposals as a way to address the problems of greenwashing. I think it helps. I think it helps. Again, you know, today most um, most, and this gets back to sort of these different coalitions about impact reporting, impact measurement. Most impact reports are used for marketing or for kind of a compliance thing with a certain subset of investors. They aren't used broadly to 
um, delineate or amplify strategy. And I do think that if you actually could get to a better version of people reporting on impact, it would go a long way towards um, addressing this greenwashing. Interesting. Um, so this is actually my last question. So if you have a question after I, I finish this question, um, you can go to the back of the room and ask your question at the mic and please identify yourself first. But, but um, let me just ask my very last question, which is, you know, we have a, a community which is really incredibly excited about the opportunities for investment in these areas going forward. For, um, so let me ask you, if I don't know if you hired uh, MBAs, but if you do hire new MBAs, what would you look for? And what are some of the really exciting opportunities out there uh, for, for new MBAs? A, we do hire MBAs at both firms that I'm involved in. Um, so check the websites for job openings. Um, and I think, that I, I just think that kind of at any point in people's careers, the place where there is the most interesting opportunity is where there's the most chaos and there's the most change. Because that's where you could actually jump in and do something. You can actually have a differentiated point of view. You can, you know, or the company that you're wishing for could have, working for can have a different, different point of view. And so kind of having the confidence to kind of wade into those messy, chaotic places, I definitely climate is one of them. You know, venture is one of them. But a lot of different investor sectors are being all upended right now. Um, you see it in the public markets. Oh my goodness, you see it in the real estate markets. I mean, things that are, Chaotic, I think, are, I personally find that energizing. But I actually think that it is also a really, it's, it's, it doesn't feel like the safe place to look for opportunity, but it's definitely an exciting place to look for opportunities. Thank you for that. Um, that's, a, that's a nice, that's a great note on which to end. So uh, let me open the floor for questions. It like this. Hi, Catherine. Nice to meet you. I'm Natalia. Um, I am doing a master's in climate change here at, Ber at Berkeley. Oh, great. And I spent the last summer at an impact uh, venture capital fund focused in food and agriculture. So most of the things that you were saying definitely resonate with me. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to ask you is there has been recent debate on how should ESG be approached and whether E is more salient than S and G. And I was wondering how you approach it in um, whole capital. Thank you. Um, so this is a much, it is, as we've seen out in the press, you know, the whole issue about ESG and what it means is, um, really complicated and more politically fraught than it has been for quite some time. And part of that is because the S and G factors are just harder to measure, right? It means different, so many different things to different people. So I feel like sort of the focus on the E is, I don't mean that as a retreat, because obviously it's central in everything we're doing at Galvanize, but it's just easier to dimensionalize and so I think people are kind of using that and falling back, not because it's more salient, just because it's actually easier to measure, which gets back to kind of a part of the big problem across the board. We at Hall Capital don't think that that is kind of the answer. We actually are still forging ahead. We are big believers in ESG, again, FCI, in our kind of stylized world, because we actually do think it's the best use of resources across all of those dimensions, human capital, physical capital, financial capital, um, that manifests itself through you know, S or G, if you will, for the others. That is really a source of strength. Awesome. Thank you so much. Hey there. Nice to see you. Good to see you as well, Katie. Um, for back, my name's Austin. Uh, I actually used to work at Hall Capital before coming here. I'm a first-year MBA student. Uh, my question is, for those of us who are involved in organizations where we're struggling with gender diversity, uh, for instance, uh, with the investment club, we have exactly one senior female lead. How would you recommend that we try to increase gender diversity, especially given that we're made up of a large male group? That actually 
as you point out, it actually creates a problem, right? Because then it's self-perpetuating how do you get into the group. You know, in, in other situations, and when we were thinking about our own kind of recruiting, either at Paul Capital or at Galvanize, um, we spend a lot of time um, trying to think about what might be systematic structural re things that are presenting an image or um, something that conveys an attitude, even if it isn't one that is. I don't know if it's about time that's meet or requirements to join or not, you know, something. Think a, kind of a pretty rigorous self-examination of if there are some of those things that are present, and then essentially combating against that, you know, if you identify what might be some of those hurdles. Um, and it's probably worth asking some people, you know, why not? You should be interested in you're in, in the same finance track, you know, it, what, it, what is it about it that isn't resonating? Awesome. Thanks so much, Katie. Hi, Katie. My name is Monique. Thank you so much for being here today. This has been tremendously insightful. So I'm a fourth year at Haas right now, and I'm interested in getting into finance myself. And so I'm curious, you were discussing at the beginning the difficulties of investing among different asset classes and how both your firms, you guys are working on every one. So I'm curious which one thus far has been the most fruitful and which one you're most excited about for the future. In terms of investment opportunities or investment areas? Yeah. They're just such, di they're different things. I mean, in Hall Capital, we're investing across all asset classes. And um, there has been probably the most activity and sort of new things, interesting things, coming out of in the venture and growth capital world over the past couple of years. Um, that we might be at a time of rotation around that, as just things are being so dramatically repriced. Things that had been not very interesting in the public markets are returning to a point of real, real interest. Got it, thank you so much. Hi Katie, Hi. my name is Emily McCabe and I'm a fourth year at Berkeley as well. So you mentioned that we're in a transition period and I think a part of that is that we're seeing historic climate policy at a federal, state and local level. So I have an example. Um, I've learned in my studies that there's an opportunity to reduce emissions in the built environment because we burn fossil fuels in buildings. So this is an opportunity for companies that manufacture electric appliances to you know, get off the ground. So I'm curious, as you evaluate companies beyond financial returns at Hall Capital Partners, is policy analysis a part of that, and should it be? You know, um, we, our job at Hall Capital is to, devise asset allocation plans for our clients and um, then implement that by identifying and hiring the best investment manager to fill out that part of a part of a portfolio. So when we're evaluating investment managers, we spend a lot of time trying to understand how they are incorporating policy aspects and policy changes, but also macro or other geopolitical things into their own investment practice. Um, so that's really where that intersects in um, Hall Capital's world. Um, although, again, we need to be aware, both in climate policy as well as other important factors, what's creating big head headwinds or tailwinds to just opportunity sets. At Galvanize, we are deeply involved in thinking about policy and analyzing that, both as it presents headwinds, tailwinds, but also with how some of their portfolio companies can um, take advantage of it or how that creates new markets for them. Again, if we're looking at something that is going to be measuring um, carbon footprints for apparel manufacturers, you know, there's different regulatory regimes that that has different degree of relevance. Um, so there, that's mu they're much more closely intertwined when we're at the actual investing in companies. And I think you need to be. Great, thank you so much. Sure. Hello, <laughs> hello Katie. My name is Matthew Potom. I am part of the weekend MBA program here at Haas. So we have heard about climate tech, ag tech, food. 
my question is surrounding waste so do you see from where you are how important or relevant is it in investing companies that deal with the big waste problem that we are going to be seeing in the near future what is your take on it what is your visibility you know um it is it's a big issue it's actually a big environmental justice issue um because of disproportionate impacts on communities from an investing area there is more that is being done there in public private partnerships or through public support or policy that we're seeing in terms of company transformation um we have seen some things um but from kind of getting back to return expectations and the ability to capture returns we our model at galvanize is specifically looking for you know compelling market rate returns most of the stuff not all but much of the stuff we've seen in kind of the waste um uh broad waste systems is still running through public partnerships um so it hasn't been as um robust in the opportunity set so far but but we're looking at different things i mean i said i mentioned we looked at this big um plastics recycling business um and a technology around that which was really interesting in the end the problem was hugely capital intensive about building facilities is really different facilities and since most of that runs through kind of long tail government local municipal contracts didn't kind of just prove out to that industry but so it's an important area but it it hasn't one that has been a really big investment opportunity set for us yet so you haven't identified any potential technologies that can make a difference well we haven't we we haven't right now but again they're looking at there's so many different things i mean you've seen some of these you know like um enzyme um plastic enzyme um degradation or recycling things you know there's a lot of work being done but since at galvanize we're looking at to invest in particular types of companies that are actually really at past the technology risk largely and into scale up risk we have not seen them in that sector yet thank you but we have it's a big world and there's a lot going on so hopefully we will i thank you kady uh my name is kai zhang i'm an mba student here so um california um thankfully it's it's very progressive in these but there are many states who are which are not <laughs> as progressive as us so i was one wondering you know what's house policy and what's house initiative right now to work with those states who are less which are less progressive to move this forward you, you know um at hall capital we are investing with investment managers um really around the world and i would say that the their kind of investment disciplines tend not to kind of run through that progressive conservative may it becomes much more about a view of the sets of companies that you're going to invest in um i would say that in our fci world right that is a subset that does skew that happens to align more with progressive investment managers that are sometimes located in progressive places but not necessarily um so it runs more through their philosophies than sort of the locations um and in galvanized world it's a a, a big issue right i think that um because it's really about what the companies are doing and there it's really the companies and what their cost benefit is i mean we have um uh, as a company we invest in that um optimizes routes of public transportation it's a, it's a software solution and and that's actually a problem solver for progressive i mean progressive or conservative if we're going to make up a continuum um though those are municipalities are just interested in solving their problem at a good price as opposed to um something that's deemed climate or not thank you Hi Katie, thank you for coming to speak with us today. My name is Ryan Tan. I'm a second year MBA student. I'm also the president of the Haas Investment Club. Austin has oh, been great. a delight to have with us. 
Um, so one of the questions we have is we have a lot of first years who are interested in public market investing. Specifically, they are interested in having impactful public market investing, whether in equities or in credit. However, the one issue that we've had is when students go into like your large asset management firms, think of like a T. Rowe, a Franklin, a capital group, is ESG or impactful investing is almost like a compliance checklist. And so what advice do you have for first years who are interested in public market investing but would like their work to actually be impactful instead of, as you mentioned, you know, you go through the investment ideas and then at the end you want to make sure that the CEO is not having an affair with one of his, you know, coworkers. <laughs> Sadly, your, your last comment doesn't necessarily align with all the other things that we're talking about. So there's bad behaviors even in really well-intentioned firms. Yeah. That's sort of a set of human dimensions. So I would, that's much more about a culture. Um, with regard to the actual practice of investing, again, there are a growing number of firms who do have it as central or at least integrated in my own kind of stylized vocabulary, I think search out those firms. I think the other um, uh, answer is, is, is to actually think about what impact really means. I think a mistake that people make is translate, translating impact into short-term causality. Um, and that's actually, I don't think that's the right way to think about impact. I think about you know, impact in the investing sense is to think about companies, the companies in which you're investing or the assets you're investing, and how, what path they're on. I mean, there are some really interesting work being done by some pipeline companies who are dramatically trying to shift kind of the source of kind of their, kind of their energy and their transmission. I mean, that's, that's interesting, right? You could have high impact by be investing in companies that are trying to really accelerate a transition. So, so I, I would encourage people to think and push themselves as to what impact really means, because um, I think that it actually can, you know, means um, aligning with and rewarding, if you will, by investing in companies that are um, making positive change and not with those that aren't. Not just because of that filter, but because I actually really think that that is a huge marker as to prospective you know, risk or opportunity. Thank you. Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, my name is Shivangi, I'm an MBA 23. Um, my question for you is um, around the combination of multi-stage investments. So um, I've worked on um, projects before, for example, <coughs> like small modular reactors or electric batteries. And what we're seeing is, there's a trend of, I guess, deep tech that needs to be commercialized with the help of both investing in the deep tech itself, but also the infrastructure that surrounds it. Um, typically, what we try to do to accelerate the transition is you try to break down the risk to see like who can invest in what's known, what's the public infrastructure. So for example, with a small modular reactor, that would be everything around the building itself. Um, and then find another investor to kind of do you know, the deep tech investment. In, in the, your specific case, you, you can invest in both. Um, would you use that in commercializing one particular technology all the way through? Or do you see that more as a risk where you feel like actually there should be more than one investor? Oh, you know, um, we at Galvanize in, our, in the first strategies are really focused on investing in companies that have, have largely satisfied the tech risk and so it becomes a product market fit, you know, addressable market scale up sets of risks. And a lot of the deep tech is still science experiments. And there's great investors that are doing that. I mean, obviously Breakthrough is leading a lot of that work. Um, and that's, that's good. That's, but that's a set of investments that probably won't have payoff for seven, 10 years. And we are really interested in companies that can helping to scale companies that can have payoffs, i.e. impact changing systems in this decade. Now, one of the things that we are doing though is that we recognize there's been, a, we think an excess stratification. 
So, which is why we've actually paired our early stage and growth cat investing in, in one strategy as opposed to segmenting it because there has been too much of that. Um, and we've seen a lot of money being raised that's quasi, you know, that's the de-risked money, which again, we can debate about the pricing of that um, and people's incentives. Um, and and I, think there, I think we need to have all of these different things. We need to have longer duration, you know, higher risk, um, hard tech. We need to have de-risk, quasi bank capital. We need kind of things in between. Thank you. Um, oh. Thank you so much. I think we're out of time. Oh. We've taken up a lot of your time. We are so grateful for all these insights and for you visiting us here uh, at Berkeley Haas. Thank you so sure. much. Thank you.